Good evening. I'm Paul Thierman. I'm director of the library here at the New York Academy of Medicine, and I welcome you to this session on sickness and the city. We have two very distinguished gentlemen with us this evening to talk about very contrasting stories. As you can see, one's going to talk about 1790s Philadelphia, Philadelphia, and the other one is going to be Arequipa in Peru. So um, I'm, we're going to welcome Billy Smith and Michael Levy. So I want to tell you just two seconds about the Academy. We've been founded in 1847. I'm director of the library, which is co-existent with the Academy. We were founded in 1847 as well. And we are now a major medical historical library because we no longer collect contemporary medical literature, but we have, oh, about half a million books of the older stuff. So, um, and this includes uh, a very extensive and wonderful rare book library of over 32,000 volumes. Uh, the Academy as a whole is set up to do work in policy development and research in public health problems, focusing on New York City, but not exclusively about New York City. So the uh, event tonight is uh, uh, actually is kind of ancillary to what we do here, but it, but it, it fits in a really good way. This was um, produced by the Consortium for the History of Science, Technology, and Medicine, which is a wide-ranging consortium based in Philadelphia, and the Academy is a member of that consortium, and they have a grant from the Pew Trust in order to do events like these. And this is actually only the third um, such event. There was one in Philadelphia and one in Chicago, and now New York City. Uh, the idea behind the event is that we get two contrasting yet melding uh, stories, one from the past and one from the present, uh, by a scientist and a historian. Have them tell you the stories and have you react. Uh, I should let you know also that this event is being videotaped, and so there was a, a disclaimer outside. If you don't feel comfortable being on videotape, even in, in passing, um, I invite you to reconsider. Um, that event, will, th that video uh, accounting of the event will be put online, and we're going to be recruiting a couple of people to comment online, and then we're going to open up those comments for further consultation. So there are some sheets, they're on the tray there, and they were outside as well, that'll give you the actual URL for where this is gonna happen, and also just gives you an opportunity to take some notes along the way. The format for the evening is going to be 30 minutes from Dr. Smith, 30 minutes from Dr. Levy, and then 30 minutes from you all. So um, get, uh, get ready, I guess, is the way to put it. I'm gonna introduce the guests in alphabetical order, but they're gonna they're going to um, do their thing in chronological order. So Michael Levy is Associate Professor of Epidemiology at, and Biostatistics at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He works at the interface of epidemiology, ecology, and statistics to understand and control vector-borne and other infectious diseases. His team uses quantitative and qualitative methods to look at the factors that have led to the urbanization of disease traditionally of diseases that have been traditionally associated with rural poverty. Uh, and recently, his lab has been able, has begun to work on the bed bug problem of Philadelphia. It's a great topic. I'm going to read what Billy Smith sent me rather than what we put up on our website. He has enjoyed teaching, researching, and writing history for slightly more than 107 years. He has published nine books and dozens of articles about early America focusing on issues of race, gender, class, disease, and GIS mapping. He's won numerous awards for both research and teaching, and teaches a good many first-generation university students and Mont at Montana State University. His most recent publication includes uh, Ship of Death, The Voyage That Changed the Atlantic World, uh, published from Yale University Press in 2013. Um, I think that, oh, one other thing. Um, this, this, this project has been many years in the making, and it was initiated by the consortium in Philadelphia, but we're doing it tonight here and uh, now because it's linked also in our minds, and we hope in your minds, to Germ City. This is a large exhibition uh, that we, the Academy co-curated with the Museum of the City of New York. It's in that building right over there, uh, which is just across 103rd Street from the Academy, um, and it's about the history of public health in New York City from the early 19th century up to the present. Um, there's also a number of public activities associated with it. Uh, the next one that we're 
putting on is um, a panel called Disease and Disparity, which is um, headed up by Samuel Roberts of Columbia University, and that's on November 28th. So without further ado, Billy. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for organizing this. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Now, I'll go ahead to talk about the yellow fever pandemic, the first one, I think, in the Atlantic world, and also how the U.S. Capitol, Philadelphia at that time, was saved by African Americans. Now, the backdrop of all this, the why, reason I have this map up here, is that uh, the most common um, vector among human beings of yellow fever is the Aedes aegypti mosquito, and it's coming at you. Uh, with global warming, uh, it's moving up our way. And in fact, it's very close, according to the vector control officer in Pennsylvania when I talked to him, to Philadelphia at this point. So not to be alarmist, but at least have a background that there is something that is important about a lot of this material. Besides the story that I hope to spin out here for you and hope that you believe um, because it's the truth. How about that? I know that's rare to say in today's world. So Philadelphia in July of 1793 is uh, basically uh, the capital of America. Now you're New Yorkers and so you might not believe this, but it's the cultural capital, it's the immigration capital, it's a political capital because uh, the federal government has moved there, uh, evacuated New York and moved there, and they're there for the entire 1790s. So this is, uh, I guess in our terms today, it's New York, LA, Washington, DC, all rolled into one. This is the place that Americans look, which is important because of what happens there and how Americans think about these things. So it's pretty peaceful for quite a long time here for the first five years of the new nation and all of a sudden as you can see there is panic that occurs uh, and the reason for the panic is that uh, Dr. Benjamin Rush, the most famous uh, doctor in America at that point and we'll talk a little bit more about him but he goes down and finds a patient and he declares there's yellow fever in the city. Uh, and that's an important announcement since it scares the hell out of people. Uh, at the time, they were calling it also black vomit. You might guess why they would call it that. Uh, it's also yellow fever. It's also yellow jack, they're calling it. Sailors do because you're supposed to fly this little uh, this flag over your ship if you have yellow fever on it because you're so infectious and nobody wants to go close to you. At least that's what they think. Uh, it's not contagious. It's only through mosquitoes, but that's what they think in any case. Uh, and it's also called uh, Bulama fever. And I will get to the island of Bulama off of Africa and where I think all of this originally started uh, in a few minutes. But people at that point, too, are also referring to it as that. Um, okay, so what happens when yellow fever breaks out when Dr. Rush says it's there? Uh, well, the first thing that happens is that actually George Washington runs away. Uh, now, he's one of the most, uh, you know, uh, heroic men in America. So this is pretty incredible. You make the decision to leave early, and it really is dispiriting to a lot of people. George Washington's leaving? Uh, now, Thomas Jefferson also runs away. Um, now, I, well, I won't go too much more into him, but, um, and basically, um, almost the entire federal government leaves, shuts down. I know we can't believe that in our own time, the federal government would shut down. Um, but the federal government just closes. Hardly anybody is left. A few clerks are left, basically, uh, for the federal government. Same is true of the city government, too. The mayor runs away. The guardians of the poor, who help the poor out, as you might guess, also run away. Uh, almost all the officials run away or die uh, because, you know, the, the, the notion that they have of epidemics at this time is that the way that you um, beat them is just to get the hell out of the city, basically. Uh, and that's what a lot of people choose to do. Not everybody. Uh, and we will talk about them, and especially the African-American community, who uh, makes a different decision uh, to stay and help people. Now, yellow fever is not a good disease to die from. Uh, when you're stung by this mosquito, about four or five days later, you'll get nauseous, uh, you'll get a high fever, uh, you really need a lot of water because you're so thirsty. 
Uh, and then uh, you might get a little better for a while. And often people are fooled because for one day you're feeling better and you're thinking, okay, everything's all right. And then the worst hits. Uh, you start to throw up black vomit because you're bleeding uh, internally. Uh, and your uh, eyes start to turn yellow. Uh, skin starts to jaundice. Uh, and then you die. Uh, so it's just a hideous disease to die from. In Philadelphia, 5,000 people die here, about 11, 10% of the inhabitants, um, which is a higher number if you just count the people who stayed in the city, basically. If we're to compare it to today and New York City, uh, it's probably like, I don't know what the population here is, but probably like if a million people died in three months to give you just some kind of concept of what this would mean. Uh, and uh, some kind of comparison. It shocks Americans. It's a new nation. Here's our capital. And in three months, uh, you know, 5,000 people die. There's also all kinds of stories that are true about the inhumane treatment of lots of people, wives leaving their husbands, husbands leaving their kids, and uh, just because they are so frightened of what this is. They think it is contagious, a lot of them, some of them think it's not, it's a, and that's part of the medical debate here. Um, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who is the most famous doctor in America at this point, uh, the signer of the Declaration of Independence, he supports women's education. I mean, he does the kind of things we would want him to do in a 21st century. I mean, he's, you know, I guess we would call him a liberal, if not a radical, in some of these senses. Um, and he thinks he's discovered to, the cure to yellow fever. Uh, and um, mostly that cure means uh, bleeding people and purging them, giving them some terrible things that make them both vomit and um, also have incredible gas and dysentery and things of that sort. He also gives these pills, by the way, to Lewis and Clark when they come by to ask him, because he is so prominent, what should we take with us? And he gives these kind of pills with him, and they write about how just every one of them is gaseous as they're going across the country, basically. But he's, uh, he differs a lot from the College of Physicians, and the College of Physicians, again, is the institution uh, in America at this point. He's a member of it. Um, they have vicious debates with one another, and uh, he separates from them. He just says, no, I've got the cure, uh, and you don't. And um, the College of Physicians basically um, says what we do today with somebody with yellow fever, that is rest and fluids. Uh, they're kind of right on the mark here. Um, he's not, uh, although he never backs off from his position. But it's also debated widely in the newspapers. So people are just incredibly confused. It's like, what should we do? Uh, both to avoid getting yellow fever, but also, uh, you know, how should we treat it? Now, a lot of the folk remedies, which have been around since the plague years, uh, is that carry tarred rope around, chew garlic, disinfect with vinegar, ring bells, don't ring bells. They stop people from ringing bells because they're so loud. They stop people from shooting cannon down the street because it starts to get too uh, much like havoc. They're thinking that, uh, a lot of them anyway, that it's coming from the miasma, that it's coming from the air somehow. So you have to clean the air, but again, it's such a debatable issue at the time that nobody really knows, not even the doctors here for certain, uh, and certainly not uh, you know, the regular public. Part of this uh, time too, and this relates to our own time for certain, is that uh, medicine becomes incredibly politicized, not just in Philadelphia, but also you know, in the rest of America, and how could it not in some ways at this time, because the argument is, is this imported in ships from somewhere? Is it local origins? Uh, is it contagious or is it not? Um, should we stay in the city? Should we not? Uh, and they're saying this in physical terms, whereas other people, again, like African Americans, are thinking about it in moral terms uh, and take a different kind of position. One of the medical students, by the way, um, for those of you who are uh, doctors in here, uh, is trying to prove it's not contagious, and so what he does is eat somebody's black vomit um, to, uh, yes, demonstrate that. He doesn't get it. He says, hey, <laughs> it's not contagious. 
nobody pays any attention to them because the debates are just so harsh. And, uh, you know, it would have been great if they would have taken his word for this. And he certainly put himself through a lot here. Alexander Hamilton, by the way, also, you know, he's Secretary of the Treasury. He catches yellow fever. Uh, and he refuses to take the treatment of Dr. Rush. Dr. Rush is a Republican. He's a Federalist. Uh, and it becomes known as the Republican cure, as opposed to the Federalist cure, which is from the French West Indies, uh, who had a lot of yellow fever. And they say, oh, no, just uh, uh, wine and bed rest, basically. When George Washington hear he hears that uh, Hamilton gets it, he sends him a bottle of wine. Uh, Hamilton uh, does rest, drink the wine apparently, and does make it through and survives it. Uh, and he's very smug about it because Hamilton's always just a total elitist, even against that play. And I'm just pointing at somebody who loves that uh, play. Uh, but, uh, all right, so who does step forward to save the city? Um, it's the first free African American community actually in America. Uh, during the American Revolution, lots of African Americans claimed their own freedom uh, through a variety of ways. They run away during the chaos of the war. They bargain with their masters in a variety of ways to shorten their terms, to actually make it like an indentured servitude. They buy their way out of slavery. And so what happens there is a lot of them go to Philadelphia. This is a city that know, is known uh, for its Quaker uh, kind of moderation towards slavery and support of anti-slavery positions. In fact, they are some of the first ones who are anti-slavery. So a lot of them go there, not just for that reason, but also to congregate with other African Americans. You know, if you want to have a chance of ever getting married, if you want to have a chance of uh, having a family, things of that sort, you need other African Americans around in this society because the society is just not going to allow you to do anything else. Uh, and also, clearly, you share a lot with other African Americans. Absalom Jones and Richard Allen are two of the most famous black founding fathers that most people have never heard of um, because uh, that's not usually taught in most schools. Um, you know, it's George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, but uh, they, they are organizing this community. They organized two churches there, for one thing, but they're also organizing the community. And when this yellow fever epidemic breaks out, uh, they step forward and say, this is our, they're deeply religious, they're both Christian, and they say, this is our moral responsibility to help out our neighbors, which is pretty amazing in some ways since we've got the most despised people in America here in some ways because of their color of their skin, <laughs> stepping forward and saying, we should do something to help other people in the city. Now, there are a number of white people, too, who are debating this issue. A lot of the Quakers, you can see in their diaries, they're going, should I run away? It's probably the safest thing to do. Should I stay? Because I have a commitment to my neighbors and to other people in this city. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Quakers divide probably half and half on that question. But the African-American community seems like almost unanimously that they step forward uh, to do a variety of tasks to help out in this community. Oh, this is just a map I've put together recently using some GIS about where the first free African-American community was in the uh, United States. Uh, and I'm very pleased that uh, the new African-American Museum in um, the Smithsonian in DC um, is displaying this uh, about talking about the first uh, free African-American community. So among the, among the various things they do is nurse the sick, deaf cart drivers. I don't have to go through those you, because you can read them. Uh, Jones and Allen also do bleeding for Dr. Rush. Um, they've apparently bled for him before. Again, Dr. Rush is a supporter of the African-American community, even though, and this shows the kind of weirdness of the times, he has a slave himself. And he's a member of the... Uh, abolitionist society. It's just a very strange, um, to us, clearly, how can you hold both of those things in your head? But clearly, he's not the only one who does it, uh, and he's part of that. Uh, and he has worked with him previously. So Jones and Allen do a lot of bleeding of people, probably doesn't really help them. And in fact, at some point, uh, Dr. Rush 
miscalculates on how much blood is in the human body, uh, and he recommends bleeding you more than the blood you've got. So if, you know, you might kind of survive the yellow fever on the ship, you might just die from being bled. That's not to blame Jones and Allen uh, by any means, because he's doing most of the bleeding, basically. But as you can see also from this comment from Absalom Jones, it's nobody wants to go near anybody that's sick or dead, because you don't know if you're going to be able to, if you're going to catch this or not. There's also a woman, Anne Seville. Uh, this is not a picture of her. We just don't have many pictures of African-American women at the time, or men. Um, but she organizes the hospital. Um, they set up a hospital in an old mansion outside the city. Uh, but for the first week or so, it is just a death house. People lying on the floor, dying on the floor, can't get any nursing care whatsoever, can't get water. And water's a key to this survival. So if you can get nursing, water, bed rest, you've got a good chance of making it through. But it is just uh, a death house. They're burying people out of there uh, in common graves because they just can't do it individually anymore. But Anne Seville organizes the uh, nursing unit there. And it's commented on by a number of the doctors who are working out there how um, she gets beds, she gets, uh, you know, blankets, she makes certain people are uh, uh, given water and all these other kinds of things. So it's a pretty incredible founding mother, even though we know virtually nothing else about uh, her, uh, except that she steps forward in, uh, in this epidemic. After the epidemic, uh, there's a lot of praise from city officials, and especially the mayor, who writes things that are published in the newspaper that people read at that point, uh, in, in praise of the African American community. However, there are, not surprisingly, uh, a number of uh, white people who are not sympathetic to African Americans, and in fact are entirely racist. Uh, and one of them, Matthew Carey, publishes an instant history of this. We think we're instant history people. Um, within a month or so after this uh, epidemic is over, you know, and the reason it ends, by the way, as you would guess, is the mosquitoes freeze in November in Philadelphia. Um, and he criticizes them. He's saying, no, you charge too much for nursing. No, you shouldn't have been doing this. You probably, some African Americans stole from people, blah, blah, blah. Now, in reality, back in the old days of the plague, this was always the case in places like London. It wasn't just African Americans at that point, but just uh, basically anybody who cared for the poor usually received a lot of criticism. But that's just putting it in the context of this kind of racism of accusing African Americans of having acted in an in uh, a non-honorable way in all of this. Um, Jones and Allen even though they're praised actually in his instant history, but he's going after the African-American community, Jones and Allen, seems to me, much to his credit, much of their credit, step forward and publish a pamphlet uh, defending the African-American community. It's the first pamphlet uh, written in entirely and published entirely by African-Americans in America. And it is pretty remarkable in terms of a, defending the African-American community, telling exactly the kind of things that they were doing, and then B, they tack on at the end a condemnation of slavery. And again, it's one of the first statements, probably the first statement we have from African-Americans who are publicly saying uh, slavery is wrong. Now, you know, that's not surprising to us, but in the 18th century, this is uh, quite a challenge uh, to the white hierarchy. Uh, but it is uh, a remarkable, this kind of yellow fever epidemic thing uh, that's remarkable to uh, encourage them to do that. Now, they go ahead and keep organizing the societies in Philadelphia, self-help societies, schools, churches, and really sets the foundation for a free, a free black community in Philadelphia that then is also going to become very active in the abolitionist movement in the 19th century, and also a place where runaway slaves can get some help uh, as they're heading north in Philadelphia, and they know of this.
All right, I can see my time is shorter than I thought, but I can talk quickly. No, I will uh, sketch out the other things. I think my contribution to this is tracking, uh, besides talking about the African-American community, is tracking the ship, I believe, uh, that carried this uh, yellow fever around the world, from Africa to the West Indies to Philadelphia, uh, and then there's ramifications after that. It's, uh, it's a colony that a lot of idealistic white British people um, are thinking we can prove uh, that slavery is not economical by setting up a colony in West Africa and hiring black people. So we can prove it to white people. Now, it's, you know, it's an idealistic kind of thing. They're incredibly naive. They know nothing about Africa. Uh, none of them ever been to Africa. So they're working on this kind of idealism, which I hesitate to uh, criticize, especially in our own day. Uh, but they say we're going to you know, take three ships down, set up uh, a, a colony on the island of Bolama, and uh, we're going to show the world, the Western world, that actually this is the way to go, and that's why we should end slavery. And again, one has to admire them, but at the same time, uh, think about how, how naive they are. So the hanky is one of three ships they take with them, and the hanky is the one we're going to follow a bit, uh, which goes to West Africa. Uh, they don't even quite know where they're going, but they end up uh, at Bolama uh, and um, encounter uh, the Bajago who are living there. The Bajago have been dealing with Europeans for about 300 years, uh, and they were the, one of the first ones who were attacked by Europeans to capture people to take back into slavery. So they're very savvy. They know how to deal with Europeans, uh, both in negotiating skills and also militarily if necessary. Well, the, the idealistic colonies uh, move into Balama uh, and um, decide, well, no, they don't decide, sorry. They move on to Balama, but don't contact the local peoples to try and buy the island, even though they said they were going to do this. Well, the Bajago attack them, kill a number of them, and about half of them get so scared they go back to London immediately and say, this isn't going to work, is it? Um, but even more decimating, after they buy Balama twice, by the way, because they, they were out negotiated so much, um, but uh, the most decimating things for them are um, these uh, mosquitoes who are seeing them with all kinds of fevers. I think it was the 1960s that I read a study of if you grow up in West Africa, at least at that point, you're going to get at least 100 stings uh, from infected mosquitoes. Not every mosquito is infected, of course. But you're going to catch things like malaria and dengue and yellow fever, uh, the, point of, uh, the point of ours right now. Uh, or at least our topic here. And that's what happens. Uh, these people die uh, like flies killed by mosquitoes, basically. Um, what's going on there is there's uh, the yellow fever, uh, the way in which yellow fever works is there's a forest version, as it's called, or sylvatic, I think is the name, uh, in which these Aedes aegypti mosquitoes pass among simians, among monkeys, uh, yellow fever. Doesn't often kill the monkeys, but they do harbor the yellow fever for other mosquitoes. Now, what happens uh, when the colonists arrive is Philip Beaver, who's the head of the colonists, uh, and others um, uh, start to cut down all these trees, and monkeys come down with them. They eat the monkeys, they think they're great, but while you're bringing down the canopy, you're also bringing down an amazing number of mosquitoes. Aedes africanus will sting humans, but it's the Aedes aegypti who then move it uh, among the humans here. It's coming out of uh, basically this tropical area. Um, about half of them die, um, and they're getting so desperate that they're going to get out of there. Um, so they get on a ship. Most of their sailors are dead. They don't know how to sail the boat very well. Uh, showing how inept everything it was on this, uh, on this voyage, basically. They run into a, uh, another warship that says, hey, the French are at war with us now. You can't go back that way. You've got to go to the West Indies. 
So they catch the uh, trade winds to the West Indies, as most of these slave ships do, unless they're going to Brazil, and um, take back with them uh, the mosquitoes in the water barrels there. And it's one of the ways that mosquitoes that are infected uh, get over to the New World. And indeed, it is slavery itself that introduces yellow fever into the New World, if you call it that, uh, North and South America, uh, because of bringing over slave ships. But in this case, it's an anti-slavery group. There's some irony to it uh, and bitterness to it. But we wouldn't have had an anti-slavery ship if we didn't have slavery, uh, basically. So they land in Granada, spread it all through the harbor there. There's a hundred ships there. Uh, and um, I won't go into detail about those accounts. But then they sail to Philadelphia. Uh, the master of this ship still hopes that he's going to be able to make some money out of this enterprise. So he goes up to Philadelphia to sell some of his goods. Uh, when he arrives in Philadelphia, when the ship arrives in Philadelphia, within four days we have huge yellow fever epidemics starting to appear, yellow fever. These red lines are places that I've been able to map of the uh, harshest of the yellow fever uh, epidemic, the deaths. So that between 25% and two-thirds uh, two of the people die in those areas. So if you could avoid these areas and live on this side of the city, then you've got a good chance of surviving it. Uh, but of course, the, uh, not of course, but the people who are living along here mostly are lower class people. Uh, and uh, not doctors and African-Americans, but lower class people. So it takes a big toll on impoverished people here. African-Americans actually, if, and, and there's no reason to remember that Mac exactly, but they live on this side of the city. They die in large numbers because they're nursing and because they're going to help the sick in this way. Same thing with doctors. Doctors die in uh, disproportionately high number too uh, during this time. I was just going to mention the New York epidemic because we're in New York, but I'll go past this. Um, the hanky makes its way back to the West Indies to catch a military convoy, a naval convoy that's going to take them back to London. When they get back to London, they immediately evacuate the ship, leave all the cargo on it, take the people off, put them in quarantine for two weeks, and burn the ship to the waterline because they've heard of this death ship, basically, that's been sailing around and creating all these problems uh, across the Atlantic. Some of the impacts of this, and I will go through this quickly, yellow fever goes global at this point. Between 1763 and 1792, there are very few uh, yellow fever epidemics in the Atlantic world. Uh, between 1793 and 1804, they just spread like crazy. Uh, and partly it's the ships going out of Philadelphia who are carrying them off. Uh, and in fact, in Spain, they outlaw ships arriving from Philadelphia, won't take them in. Uh, but you can see visually here how much yellow fever really for the next decade just affects the Atlantic world. Let me skip past this. The Balama fever also for Europeans, uh, what they really has driven home to them is that um, this is the white man's graveyard. If you go to West Africa, you're going to die. Uh, and it's one of the reasons for a long time that Europeans don't invade Africa until tropical medicine comes along. Uh, so that's a lesson that Europeans learn out of this anyway, is no invading of these places. The Haiti Revolution is also occurring just about the same time, Saint-Domingue, that's going to become Haiti. Uh, and uh, yellow fever there uh, is also uh, deterring troops, especially from Britain, who just die like flies coming into this area, uh, as the African Americans are going to know. Napoleon, when he loses Haiti, partly because of yellow fever, says, well, we don't need Louisiana anymore. The only reason I wanted Louisiana is to feed uh, the slaves in Haiti. So he sells off Louisiana to us, sort of changing international relations and also where these empires going to. The lessons for future epidemics, just to, although most historians don't want to really draw lessons. Well, let me go back. Um, 
seems to me is a debate about proper government response is very heated at this time. Lots of people don't want to be quarantined. The debate about quarantine of incoming ships, uh, and especially merchants are leading the call to, no, don't quarantine the ships coming in uh, because we're gonna lose money. Uh, medicine and cures are politicized, as we know in our own time, it certainly is then. Mass exodus from cities, I believe we can always expect in lots of these kind of epidemics. Now, if it is contagious, that's really gonna be terrible because uh, it's gonna be uh, carrying it out into the countryside as well. And finally, uh, poverty pockets are hit the hardest by this disease, which might differentiate it a little bit from uh, Michael's areas that he's gonna be talking about. Finally, thank you very much, human beings, and uh, talk to you later. That, that, that was really cool. Thanks, thanks Dr. Smith. <laughs> and, and thanks, Paul, and, and all the organizers for bringing me here today to, uh, to talk about bugs in the city, vector-borne Chagas disease in Arequipa, Peru. So Carlos Chagas discovered the disease that now bears his name before he saw a single human case. He was working in a, a small town of La Sance in, in Minas Gerais, where he'd been sent to investigate a malaria outbreak among railway workers. And these, these railway workers were connecting Rio to the Amazon basin. This was 1909, the height of the rubber boom. And Chagas goes to this town. He sets up a lab in an abandoned railway car. And he becomes familiar with the, the local blood-sucking insect. And he writes a, a couple years later in his journal that once we, we heard of the blood-sucking habit of this insect and its proliferation in human dwelling places, we became very interested in ascertaining if it by chance were, as I immediately supposed, a transmitter of parasite of man or another vertebrate. So he sees this bug and he immediately thinks it's going to be transmitting something. And he's writing at, at, the, at really the end of a decade of discovery of bugs transmitting parasites. About 10 years earlier, Ronald Ross had described transmission of avian malaria through the mosquito, and then a year later, human malaria through the mosquito. Leishmania through the, the sandfly and African trypanosomiasis through the tsetse fly had all been described in the last 10 years. So it was very much in the, in the news, bugs transmitting parasites. But it's really lucky that Chagas thought to look in the bug. It's really easy to see the parasite inside the vector. It's really, really hard to see it in a human case. So he sees this, this parasite inside a bug, and he sends the bugs to his, his mentor, Oswaldo Cruz. And Cruz exposes a number of animals to the bugs and succeeds in infecting a marmoset. Marmosets probably aren't that important in Chagas disease. It, but for, for a number of reasons, he used a marmoset. And again, it was probably luck because the marmosets probably ate the bugs because they're insectivores and became infected in, in that way. Back in Lasance, Chagas goes looking for the parasite anywhere he can, finds it finally in the blood of a cat and then in the blood of a little girl named Berenice. And this is not a picture of Berenice, but that is Carlos Chagas there. So today, millions of people are infected with the parasite that causes Chagas disease. I use this estimate from uh, Chuck Norris et al. Because if I put up an estimate from the WHO or the CDC, you might, you might think that we had some idea of how many people have Chagas disease. We really have no idea. I, I think Dr. Norris may be overestimating slightly. I, I would say probably five to six million people are infected. But I, I'm really not going to argue with them. But um, there is an acute phase of the disease after infection, but like many things, it has flu-like symptoms, and it's rarely diagnosed. Most of the five to six million people who have the parasite are in, have the indeterminate form of the disease. They have no signs or symptoms of their infection, and the only way they would ever know they're infected is if they got a blood test. Some 20 to, percent, 20 to 30 percent of those people will develop determinate forms, which are very difficult to treat and often fatal. So this is the, the bug, which we call in, in Peru the chirimacha. And I brought one because, of course, I always bring a bug. So you, you become infected with this parasite. This is the infectious form here in the feces of the bug, not through the bite. So the, blood, the bug bites you like a bed bug and sucks blood for about 20 or 30 minutes, and then it defecates on you. And this is something that many blood-feeding insects do. Mosquitoes do this. You just never see it. 
But these bugs are, produce a, a lot of feces. On the wall here, all these black and white streaks are, are bug poop. And when the bugs are infected, that poop is teeming with parasites. Control of, the, of this bug is, is one of the greatest hits of public health for the last 20 or 30 years. In, in exhibit A here is the range probably in the, in the 80s and early 90s, and then B is from 2006. And it, right now we've even gotten it a, a little further controlled than that. And the control of Chagas disease, uh, the vector control is, is very much built on conventional ideas of vector control, that, which came out of the military. So to, to pick up Dr. Smith's story a little bit, after the Spanish-American War, the U.S. Milita military controlled Aedes aegypti in, in Cuba and eliminated yellow fever and almost eliminated it from Puerto Rico. But from a, if you have a, a military idea of control, you have a, a lot of people doing a lot of, a lot of um, activities without necessarily the, the participation of, of the population that you're trying to control the, the disease in. And this, 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 uh, this approach has survived to to the Chagas disease campaigns, and um, even in the nomenclature, we, you start the campaign with this, this survey where you see where the bugs are, and then there's the attack phase where you go door to door spraying insecticide, and then after that, you have this endless surveillance phase where you're looking for the reemergence of the bugs. So originally, this, this initiative called the Southern Cone was to eliminate the insect. And that got slightly changed to eliminate the transmission of the parasite by the insect. And since we needed a metric to see if that was achieved, that got defined as keeping prevalence in kids under five below 2%. So there are these subtle shifts in what the, the aims of these massive insecticide campaigns were. So based on that definition, transmission has been disrupted in Uruguay, Chile, Brazil, and, and very recently in Paraguay and not to, disrupted in the, the Chaco region, which, which is this region, region here. And in pretty much all these areas, Chagas was a rural disease. And then this little blip here is Arequipa, where the disease became very much an urban problem. So here's the city. There's a population rapidly approaching one million people. And everything started in Arequipa in 2001, when an infant died of acute Chagas disease. And when you see a case of acute Chagas disease, that usually means there's another thousand cases that you're not seeing. So the Ministry of Health, with um, funding from the Canadian government, started a door-to-door -door insecticide campaign in this district of Hunter, where the, where the kid died. And I'll show up here the uh, infested houses in red. And after completing that campaign, we went to a, a more infested area. And in the last 10 years, we've kind of been working counterclockwise through the city, applying insecticide. And we've now treated about 70,000 houses. And the bug's pretty much gone. So it's been, a, it's been very effective vector control. What, what my team does is we follow the Ministry of Health as they spray insecticide. We grab the bugs as they come out of the walls when you spray the insecticide. And then we test people for the disease. We test the bug for the disease. And, and we map everything. And I'll show, I'll show some patterns of transmission from um, three different sites. The first is Guadalupe. This is a, a community of about 400 households on either side of this hill and a population of about 2,200. People first came and settled in Guadalupe in 1969 following agrarian reform in Peru. And this was um, a, following a military coup. Uh, General Velasco basically broke up the latifundo system of agriculture. And in doing that, uh, caused a lot of a scarcity of, of food and people came into the city. But the vast majority of people came to this hillside in the 80s and 90s as they were escaping the shining path terrorism. And this is Abimal Guzman, the head of the Shining Path, right after he was captured and put in a cage in, in prisoner garb. And he lived about a mile from this hill, and, or he was born about a mile from this hill. And, and possibly because of that, he never really attacked Arequipa as much as some more rural areas in southern Peru. Arequipa became known as a safe haven. People flooded into the city. So this is, so we went, to, we went door to door and, and sprayed houses and caught bugs. And this is a, where we found bugs. It's kind of a smooth picture of where the bugs were. About a little over half the houses had bugs. And they were pretty much all over the community. And in terms of bugs that had the parasite, there were some areas where there were bugs, but no parasite. 
so there's some clustering of bugs carrying parasite. And then within those clusters, there were these kind of hot spots of human disease. So people who were being, people who were infected were very much clustered in space. And what it looked like was the bugs had been there long enough to spread throughout the community, whereas the parasite might have been introduced fairly recently and was still spreading outwards from one or multiple sites of introduction. And if that's true, then the people living at the kind of wave front of the parasite would be exposed for much less time than those living closer to the site where the parasite arrived. So it's kind of this idea that the parasite was spreading out, leaving infected people in its wake. And if you looked at the age of the infected people and the prevalence, it was fairly flat. There was about 5% of kids were infected and about 4.5% of adults. So it, it looked like a fairly recent epidemic process. And we were able to kind of retrace this process and show that transmission was through multiple recent microepidemics. And that was important because it, it meant that the damage done by the, by the parasite, what, we weren't seeing it in hospitals yet, and that wasn't because the parasite wasn't virulent for some reason. It was just because not, not enough time had, had occurred for the disease to progress. And it also was important to, to note that the, it took a while for this epidemic to get going. It took about 10 years to climb up to 1% infection. And then once it started going, like most epidemics, it went really quickly. But this is a very long time course for the epidemic. It's nothing like yellow fever. So running summary, in a peri-urban area, the bugs were everywhere. The parasite was still spreading through the bug population. And humans were recently infected, and about 5% of, of people were infected in this area. So our original grant was to compare urban Chagas disease to rural Chagas disease. So we finished up our work in, in this urban area and we went looking for a, a little pueblo out of a telenovela. We were looking for this very traditional rural area to, to work in. And it doesn't exist anymore in southern Peru. Most of the rural areas are fairly condensed population within agricultural settings. So these fields here might be alfalfa or onion or other things that are grown in the region. And they're often owned by large corporations. And the people who work in these fields don't, don't live on them. They live in these fairly dense settlements right around the fields. So this is a, a community about the same size as Guadalupe and pretty much the same density of housing. But we saw a very different pattern of infection in this area. We had up here in gray are where we found bugs. So we found bugs uh, somewhat clustered in the community, and then we found a tight cluster of bugs carrying parasite within the clusters of bugs. But when we looked at people, infected people, they were all over, and they weren't really associated with the bugs carrying the parasite. When we looked at the relationship between age and infection, we saw a lot of infection in, in older individuals, and only one case in children out of over 100 that we tested. So here it looked like there had been transmission a long time ago that had been disrupted, and that the, the cases that were occurring now weren't due to the bugs that were carrying the parasite that we were observing. So we, did the, we tried to recreate this process to see when transmission might have been disrupted, and we guessed that it was around 1995. And then a, a biologist in my group just went to the library and started reading the newspaper. Uh, and she got up to April 7th in 1995, and, and the headline was All Out War Against the Chirimachas. And what had happened was uh, then President of Peru, Alberto Fujimori, had visited our study site, La Jolla, during his re-election campaign. And I imagine what went down was he said, what do you want? And everyone said, we want to get rid of the Chirimachas. And he said, great. And a little bit afterwards, he sent some people to, to treat the houses with something. We're, we're not exactly sure what he treated the houses with, but it didn't seem to be insecticide because the bugs didn't go away for very long. But maybe uh, shortly thereafter, the Ministry of Health came and, and treated it with the proper insecticides and got rid of the bugs. So in the peri-urban area, the bugs were, had spread everywhere. The parasite was still spreading, and there were these little microepidemics of infected people. In the rural areas, the bugs had been eliminated around 1995, 1996, but they came back. And then the parasite came back, but it hadn't been around long enough to, to reestablish infection in children, at least. Still, there about 13% of the population was infected from these now extinct transmission processes. So we then moved to the, the city itself, to a very urban area. And I, I'm, I'm an ecologist, so I thought I'll do a transect. 
and we we had these we had noticed early on that there were never any bugs at the very edge of the city if you look up here now the the infested houses are in blue up here there were never any bugs and we had two initial hypotheses the first was that the vectors were still moving out through the city and just hadn't reached the edge and the second was the vectors might be hitting some environmental limit and just couldn't go that, uh, any further and I'm going to argue now that it was, it was really a third hypothesis, that, that the process of urbanization of the city is constraining the distribution of the bugs. So our transect was about two blocks wide and about two kilometers long. And at the very top is at the, at the base of a mountain, so it's a little bit higher up and it's uh, about two degrees cooler. But the, the real gradient in the transect is a gradient of development. At the bottom, you can see there's kind of this grid pattern. This is a traditional part of the city. It had been around for at least 80 years, and it was fairly middle class. Um, and you'll see right about here, the grid pattern breaks down. And these communities are known as Pueblos Jovenes, similar to Guadalupe. They'd been um, populated in the 80s and 90s, and it, things are a little more ramshackle. And at the very top is an invasion. And the way that Arequipa grows, like, like Lima and many other cities, is people come and in a very organized fashion in Peru and build little houses on unoccupied land. So then the, the way you, we often imagine this happening is a group of people get together and they carry estera, which is a woven wall, up into a, into a part of the city where there's no housing, set up a little house and fly the Peruvian flag and wait. And sometimes the police show up in, in a day or two and kick them off the land. But more often, they just leave them waiting. And they can wait for years and years. And the hope is that they'll eventually be given title to the land. And in this case, this invasion was about 12 years old. They, no one had title to their land. They were still in this kind of waiting game to see if the, the government would formalize their, their lots. So we first did a, a survey in this area in, in 2009. And we found, in gray here are kind of the, the number of bugs we found in each spot we found bugs. We found a lot of bugs in the wealthier area, in the Pueblo Tradicional, which is a little surprising. And we found a lot of bugs in the Pueblo Joven, which was not surprising, we were expecting that. And then there were no bugs at the very top at the invasion, which is what, what we kind of expected. And then um, a long game of chicken between the Canadian government and the Pan American Health Organization and the Peruvian Ministry of Health came to a head. So the Canadian government had financed the treatment of the first district, and then they said, all right, we, we financed this. Now we're leaving, and Peru, you have to keep the campaign going. And Peru said, we don't have the funds to keep the campaign going. And the Canadian government said, OK, well, we'll do one more district. And the same thing happened. And that went on for about five years. And finally, they just left. The Pan American Health Organization and, and the, the foreign funders just pulled out completely and, and fairly abruptly. And we, we didn't have insecticide for two years. So we, um, we repeated the, the study and went back in March and May of 2010 and still didn't have insecticide. So we did it one more time. And finally, the district came up with the money to, to spray the area. And what, what was interesting. What we got to see by repeating this transect was that the, the bug populations kind of grew fairly well at the top of the transect, but they never crossed that invisible line into the invasion area. And when we finally got insecticide back and treated the area, we didn't treat the invasion. So there were no bugs there. So we wanted to, to test the hypothesis that the bug was still moving outward through the city. So we, we asked everyone when they first saw these bugs in their house, and no one, no one could answer that question. It's just not something that people <laughs> remember. So we got some help from some sociologists in Lima and um, used a technique called event history calendars. And these work by, you, you basically, you ask people about things they care about and create a, a timeline of, of events that, that are important to, to them in their lives. So we'd often ask, you know, when was your first child born? When was your ch second child born? And some big events like the earthquakes in, in Arequipa. And then we'd use that timeline to jog people's memory. So we'd say, when your first child was born, do you remember being worried about the chirimachas getting into their cradle? No, well, what about when your second child was born? Do you remember worrying about, about your second child being bitten? 
And by doing this, we could get a kind of a range of, peop of when people first noticed these bugs in their houses. And what we could see is that the bugs had clearly been in the traditional part of the city for a long time. And they've been in the Pueblo Holman for a long time. And then we see this kind of, this nice trend where it looks like the bugs have been moving outward through the city. But the, if you look at the axes here, this trend goes from about 1980 on, on to, to 2000, and then the x-axis is in meters. So the bugs have moved about three or 400 meters in 20 years. So that, that's not, it doesn't take these bugs 20 years to move three or 400 meters. It would probably take them less than a day. So the bugs, the bugs are moving outward through the city, but they're not moving at bug speed. Something is constraining their ability to, to move outwards through the city. In terms of, of whether they're hitting an environmental limit, I mentioned before we saw a very robust growth of the bug populations right at the top of the, of the Pueblo Joven, um, which you wouldn't expect if they were hitting an environmental limit. If it was too cold for them, we wouldn't expect them to grow. So we don't think it was, it was some environmental factor. The idea is it's really it's the process of urbanization itself that's constraining the bugs. And there's a there's a very a very powerful argument for formalization in, of of informal properties, and and a lot of that argument comes from a um, Peruvian economist Hernando de Soto, who who writes that formalization of property brings numerous social, economic, and health benefits to residents, and increased tax revenue to local and regional governments. Because once you give people a title to their land, then you can tax them, so it's it's a win-win in some sense. The residents can get water, electricity, and sewage, and then you can tax them. And I should add, you can also kind of win their allegiance in terms of voting. If you're the mayor who formalizes the property, you can kind of, you now have a lot more voters in your district. So it's, it's maybe a triple win. The problem though is if, you, if that's done without reasonable and enforcing, enforceable zoning code, it leads to a great increase in stuff. Once people have title to their land, they tend to bring in domestic animals. They tend to build more rooms in their houses. They tend to use better materials like brick and CR, which is a local block that, that people use, and have more kids. And so now all of a sudden you have a lot more hosts for the bugs, and you also have a lot more habitat for them to live in. So the bricks especially, Arequipa is a seismic zone, so they use those, those bricks that have the little holes in them. I don't know if you've seen these, but every hole is precisely the diameter of, of a cherry matcha. And these bricks kind of bake during the day, just very, a lot of solar radiation. So the bricks get nice and toasty, and then at night, the bugs can just crawl into these holes and have a, have a nice refuge. So you get a lot more, and I should also add, you, you buy bricks by the thousand in Peru. You can't, it's just impossible to buy fewer than a thousand bricks. And they come in a big truck, and they kind of dump the, the pile of bricks in front of your door. And then you can use however many you need to build the room or whatever you're using. And say you use you know, 800 bricks and you have 200 left over, what better than to make a little guinea pig pen out of them? So pretty much every house that has bricks has piles of extra bricks on the roof. It's, no one throws them away and there's no secondary market for bricks. So they tend to be used around animals. So again, you're bringing the, the homes to the shiri matches right next to, the, to their blood meal. So what happens to transmission of the parasite when you run out of insecticide for two years? When we first started, we had two microepidemics, and then one group, colony of, I think, three or four infected bugs. And then you can, you can watch that colony, that little colony grow into a third microepidemic. And then right up here is the fourth mic microepidemic seeded. But this was clearly a very, very recent introduction of the parasite. And we only had about, we had 14 out of 1,000 people infected along this transect. And some of them were infected clearly elsewhere. Some of them were living up in areas where there wasn't an, even any parasite in the area. So a running summary. In, in Guadalupe, we had bugs all over, with parasites still spreading in fairly large but recent microepidemics that infected about 5% of the population. In the rural area, the bugs had clearly spread a long time ago, transmitted a lot of Chagas, infected 13% of the population, but then they were, they were treated, they went away, they came back, and the parasite reemerged. And then in the, in the very urban areas, the bugs were 
spreading, but they were constrained by the process of urbanization. They couldn't get into these invasions, which were, as Billy, Billy mentioned, the, the poorest of the poor were, for, in, a, in a weird way, protected from disease in this case. And there were very, very recent microepidemics that probably had infected less than 1% of, of the population. So um, we're in New York, so I'll, I'll talk about bed bugs. Uh, <laughs> so this is, this is some recent research from 1912, uh, three, three years after Carlos Chagas describes Chagas' disease. Uh, French scientist Emile Brunt um, thinks I should really check bed bugs. And he writes a paper, and, and this is it. This is in an excerpt of the paper. This is, this is the whole thing. And it basically says, I took two mice and gave them, infected them with parasites and put 100 bugs on them. And almost 100 out of 100 picked up the parasite. And then part two of the paper is I took some poop out of some of the infected bugs and put them on the mice and infected two out of two of the mice. So this, um, this had been kind of lost until the internet kind of <laughs> brought back all these old documents. And uh, Renzo Salazar in my lab thought it might be a good idea to re repeat this experiment because, like I said, this is all, all we had of, of the experiment. So we, we, we took a mouse, or I should say we took 10, 10 mice and infected them with T. cruzi, Trypanosoma cruzi. And then we put 20 bed bugs and allowed them to feed on the mouse. And just like the older study suggested, we, we infected almost all the bugs that we fed on the mice. So we knew that bed bugs could pick up the parasite from a mouse. We then did the, the second part, and we took, we had this room that we filled with these big aquaria. And in each aquarium, we put one uninfected mouse with 20 bugs that we previously fed on an infected mouse. So we had infectious, but infected bugs and uninfected mouse. And the mice turned around and ate the bed bugs because mice are insectivores, and we should have thought of that. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> it's kind of lucky that we didn't because we were able to show that nine out of twelve of the mice became infected. Uh, again, the oral route of infection is much—it's much easier to be infected through the oral route. So just like the original experiment with the um, with the uh, the monkey that that Cruz used to show that this parasite was infectious, we were able to show that the parasite in the bed bug was, was viable, which, which we didn't know, right? We knew we could see the parasite in, in the bed bug, but we didn't know that it, that it was working and, and infectious to a host. So then we, we did a little more work and infected a bed bug, took the poop out of the bed bug, scratched a little wound on the back of the mouse where it couldn't reach it, so it couldn't get it into its mouth. And we infected three out of five mice that route. And then just to be a little more natural, we Instead of scratching a wound, we allowed bed bugs to bite the back of the mouse's neck and just form a bite mark, and we put bed bug poop on that bite mark, and also were able to infect the mouse. So there's, there's no doubt in my mind that bed bugs are competent vectors of Japanosoma cruzi. That means they, can't, they can transmit it. I, I don't think that's a question. The question is, is will they or are they? And that we, we frankly just don't know. So we've been um, trying to get at that question, but I, I think um, maybe to explain how we get at that question, I like to, I like to frame Chagas disease transmission like a fire. Um, you'll see if you read epidemiology literature, there's all this math and you kind of do all these equations and come up with your, your, your estimates of how infectious something is, but it, it ignores some, some of the, the differences in the ways that this epidemic burns. And especially when you think of a fire, you think of, of, of different forces that start the epidemic. Are, those forces are very different from the forces that maintain it. And those differences are still different from the ones that allow it to reemerge following control. So in southern Peru, the kindling of the epidemic that really gets it started is the guinea pig. Guinea pigs are perfect hosts for the chirimachas. They're absolutely helpless animals. They can't swat. They can't bite. They have, they have no defense except huddling. All they can really do is huddle against the wall of their enclosures, which, like I mentioned, are often made of bricks and full of cherry matches. So what we found is, is that they're also very infectious. When they're infected with a the parasite, they can have a lot of parasitemia, so a lot of parasite in the blood. 
But it's, it's not just the, the nature of the guinea pig that makes them good kindling. It's also the way they're raised. So in, in, um, in southern Peru, the, the guinea pigs are fed almost exclusively on alfalfa. And alfalfa is a very water-dependent crop. And in the rainy season, which is January to March, it's really cheap. So people raise a lot of guinea pigs, and then the, the chirimachas come, and you have a lot of guinea pigs, a lot of chirimachas around a, a lot of guinea pigs. And then in the dry season, the price of alfalfa triples, and that's when the guinea pig festivals start. So being a guinea pig in June in Peru is kind of like being a turkey right about now in the United States. It's not, it's not a good thing to be. And so you have people either eat their guinea pigs or have these big cookouts, which are a lot of fun. And so you have a, a large guinea pig population all of a sudden becoming a small guinea pig population. And you have a lot of bugs that were feeding on a lot of guinea pigs, and now they're feeding on a very few guinea pigs. And that allows the parasite to just propel itself through the bug population. So you can just have this big flare-up of, of parasite in the vector populations. That doesn't last, though. So this is a, a simulation of, of parasites moving through a bug population with guinea pigs. Uh, bottlenecks in guinea pig populations, but it dies out. At some point, you just don't have an infectious guinea pig in that bottleneck. What you need to maintain the epidemic are, are logs. <laughs> these, are the, these are the logs of the epidemic. They're, dogs don't live that long in Peru. I, I think, on average, about five to seven years. But, and they're, and they, they don't have this weird population fluctuation that leads to these flare-ups of, of transmission, but they, they just keep it going. So if you add a dog to this, to this uh, system, you can keep the parasite transmitting over a course of, of years. Then we come and, and we douse these fires with insecticide, just like Fujimori had done during his election campaign. You put it all out, and then the bugs come back, because they always come back. And then the parasite comes back, and it seems that it may be coming back from the coals of the epidemic, which is us. This is Berenice, who Chagas first diagnosed with Chagas disease. She lived to be in, into her 70s. She never got sick, but she very well may have still had the parasite in her body. Hum, we're not, humans aren't usually that infectious to bugs, but we live a long time. So you get rid of the bugs, they come back, and they can pick up the parasite again from humans, and the whole thing can start all over again. Hopefully it won't, but it, it can. So the question we're asking now is, might there be a similar cast of hosts for bed bugs, either in Peru, because the bed bugs are now emerging in Arequipa, like they are in pretty much every major city. And we, we, um, we, we actually don't know what they feed on. In the lab, you can feed bed bugs on chickens, on guinea pigs, on pretty much anything. We feed them on condoms. You, you put blood in a condom, and they'll come and feed through the condom. They're not that picky. But we don't know what they feed on in the field, meaning in people's bedrooms. So I, I want to talk a little bit about how to control vectors, because I mentioned it Conventional vector control has grown out of this military paradigm. And that works great uh, for Chagas disease in Chile under, under Pinochet. And, and the joke in Peru is that when, when the Chileans eliminated uh, Chirimacha, the, the sprayers would come to the door with the Carabinero, the Chilean police, and participation rates were 99.9%. .9%. And then um, Say what you will about the Peruvian government right now. It, it's not an authoritarian government in any way. And when, when you try to apply this very militaristic approach to vector control, it doesn't work. We've had areas with 60% of participation in vector control. And the bugs come back. And initially, they come back from houses that didn't participate in the, in the control. And then they spread. And we have all sorts of high-tech ways to, to map where they might come back and put it on a phone and send our technicians out to, to look for them. And now we also have bed bugs coming back. But the problem is that the, the military paradigm just might not be working. It, an alternative is to model vector control after the, after the immune system. And the immune system is a great model because it, it works across scales. So that the same system that protects a mouse also protects a moose. And for Chagas, that's really important because you have to get rid of these bugs from a house, from a block, from a community, and from a city. You need something that works at, at different scales. And also, the immune system addresses multiple threats. It shifts, it's flexible for shifting aims, and it regulates the size of control through feedback. The more bugs you find, the more control you do. So I'll, I'll, I'll go pretty quickly, because I'm getting the, 
I'll kind of skip the details, but the idea is that we, we, we're trying to work with community health workers to look for bugs, and if they find bugs, they train more community health workers. So just like when a T cell finds a pathogen, it, 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 uh, it uh, clonally expands. And we're trying to give the technicians who are searching for bugs a little bit of autonomy so that they can integrate all these fancy algorithms with things they pick up on the street that are very hard to, to digitize and to analyze. With that, I'd just like to thank my lab in Peru and everyone who is involved. Thanks. So I'm going to turn it over to you all and these two fine speakers. Um, and um, if you have questions for them, direct it to them. Yes, sir. Um, it's, it's actually the bugs will only bite you at night, which is nice. So when <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know when I when I rent where our, our house and our student house, you know, I checked it really well. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's just not. The, the risk is, is much more when you're checking the bug. Mm -hmm. So you, you squeeze out the poop and look at it under a microscope, and, and that's where, where you have to be the most worried. But otherwise, it's, these bugs would never, uh, never bite you during the day. They're, they're huge. Hmm. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, so I was wondering if there was any institutional memory in Philadelphia of the heroism of the African American community. I don't know, maybe it's. Right. I, I think I understand. Yes. Um, you know, unfortunately, what happens with race relations in Philadelphia and lots of other places is that uh, within the next decade or so, and not because of this particular thing, but um, America in general uh, hardens its perspective on race relations where they had kind of, you know, opened them up a little bit more during the revolutionary era. And so... Uh, I mean, people do acknowledge now uh, the importance of, you know, Richard Allen and Epsilon Jones and the churches and, the, and also uh, Anne Seville. But otherwise, I'm not sure that there's a lasting effect directly because it just gets too difficult in some ways. Yes, ma'am. I understand. Um, what I can say is this, that uh, it does hit the population of 20 to 40 year olds the hardest. And at that era, or? At that era and I can measure that. Um, and I've just heard recent talks about, you know, the, uh, the flu epidemic of 1918, where they're able to identify exactly that. And it also hits the 20 to 40 year olds. 
They can do that biologically and identify that. Unfortunately, I, I just can't do that with the data that I have there. So whether or not there's a difference between, uh, you know, if you're pregnant or not, I, again, my data just doesn't, won't reveal it, yes. There's more, well, I can say this too. There are more men who die than women. But again, is it a social factor because more men are going down to work on the docks and things of that sort uh, than are women who are going down and working on the docks? Uh, but so I can't disaggregate is there a specific biological part or is it social, perhaps environmental too, uh, as to what you're exposed or not? Mm -hmm. correlation in the wet nurses reducing the, the uh, yellow fever in the children that were born. Mm -hmm. so I'm noticing that if that is the cure, then that would make sense for the pregnant woman to not. To also do that, yes. Exactly. Yeah. I've never heard that, but that's a great point, though. Yeah. That's what I did for my PhD. So oh, okay, I yes, all right. <laughs> Yes, but I do know that, yes, passing along some immunity at least for, what, two years or something, exactly. a year and a half. Four, three, eight months, um, yes, and they would do it for longer. Yes, exactly right. I know, yes. And I wish I knew. That's a great question, a great point, too. Yeah, exactly, and, and that's the worry, you know, as we're, we're controlling the disease, but n not as fast as, as the city's growing and developing, so the, the, the number of susceptible households is, is increasing quicker than we can treat existing households. And the, I should say the idea was to eliminate the insect from the city as a whole, and so, you know, that, that's... I, th I think that carpet was pulled out from under us because everything was designed with that in mind. We sprayed every house twice, which you'd never do if you were just trying to stop the transmission. So we're, we're really stuck because, you know, we started this elimination campaign. We, we need to kind of ignore the shifting policy and, and continue the elimination campaign or else it's just going to come back. I'm, I'm fine with it in this case, and, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> um, you know, it's a great question, and, and you know, we, we think about this a lot. But in, in this case, it's an invasive bug. It, it was originally from the Chaco region of, of Bolivia, especially, and, and part of, of northern Argentina. And just like Aedes aegypti, it was brought, and brought by humans into Peru and other areas. So, so I won't miss it. I mean, I, I personally will because it's a really cool bug. But I, I, <laughs> And, and I don't think it'll have a broader effect on the ecosystem. Spraying every house with delta methrin twice, that's a much bigger <laughs> worry. <laughs> well, I wonder that about the Aedes aegypti, too. I mean, because you probably know more about it than I do, that there's efforts to sterilize one of the genders and therefore make them disappear, basically. And, uh, you know, nobody likes mosquitoes, but surely they have an environmental function uh, that's important. Yeah, and, and I mean, there's, uh, there's sterilization techniques, and, and then there's also CRISPR-Cas, where you can do, you know, if you believe the hype, anything, and mm -hmm. you can drive these mosquitoes to extinction in a way that would be very out of control. The, the um, you know, what's it called? The, the, the company that's, that's pushing sterilized um, male mosquitoes, mm -hmm. that, that's not as scary, because you just you release all these male mosquitoes in one spot, and hopefully the, the females only mate with those and you, you decrease the population, but it doesn't spread. Whereas the genetically modified mosquitoes that they're developing for, for malaria and, and, and for yellow fever, that, that, that you can't control once that's out of the bag, it, 
It's going to spread. Mm -hmm. Thanks. That's a great question. There are a couple research labs working on vaccines, but there's not a lot of funding or market for, for vaccines. Um, I mean, it, it's always been in the United States, and there's always you know, a handful of cases, and especially in the South. We have the bugs. Um, they get up all the way to, there's a bug in New Jersey. So they've, um, we do have the bugs, but they're, they're, they're sylvatic, so they, they rarely get into houses in the way they do in Peru. The, um, there are two drugs to treat, and there's a it's kind of a long story, but one of them, uh, the patent was donated to Brazil, and it was produced at a very low price, and we used to be able to get it, and, and we treat a lot of kids with it. The other drug was WHO brokered a deal um, mainly for African trypanosomiasis to make this drug freely available. So once the free one was available, we couldn't get the cheap one anymore because people were afraid to buy something when there was a free alternative. And everyone was a little worried to use this drug because it's, it's a pretty, there's a number of side effects. And then uh, PharmaBro bought the first drug. Do you remember Martin Scarelli a couple years back? Oh, that, was, yeah. that was the second drug he bought to get this, this um, yeah, it's a long story. But, um, that's finally being worked out and, and the drug's hopefully going to be available. And the problem is diagnosis though. So you can, the, the drug's cheap, but you know, of those six million people with Chagas disease, probably about six million of them haven't been diagnosed, and then six million of them haven't been treated. So it's it's a question of of screening, uh, to, to to first and then and then treatment. Well, we were actually having a drink before we came here, talking a little bit about that. Maybe I was having a drink. He was drinking uh, tea. That's why he was more uh, cogent than I was. Um, I thought that it was interesting for me because the epidemics I've looked at historically, it is almost always the impoverished areas that get hit the worst, and not just with yellow fever, but also then with cholera uh, in the 19th century. And so to find, though, that his circumstances are different. And so it, it's different uh, uh, in terms of how it works out on the ground today in different places. Yeah, and I, uh, for my part, I, I really like the mapping. And you can see the, the epidemic spread from the, from the wharf. And I'm from Philly, so I especially like to, right. I, yeah. I know those streets. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm interested, I'm interested to look at the, you know, the timing to, you know, if you can really, I know there are a lot of ships coming in with, with the mosquitoes, and it, it almost seems to me the mosquitoes must have been there first, just because it's. And I so don't quickly. know if again, <laughs> I can't tell <laughs> that's if that's the, the case. Yeah, exactly. No, that's quite all right. Um, but yes, the I mean, and as you know, again about the Edes aegypti, they'll only fly a hundred yards in their lifetime. So if they get congregated down at the uh, at the wharf there in the dock, that that's why it uh, really stays with that pretty much, even though it spreads to other areas. Whether it was there before or not, I'm not sure. I'm sure there are other um, ships that come in from the West Indies that bring uh, also, you know, bring yellow fever. So I'm not claiming this is the only one, but it, it, it does get there about five days before it breaks out. So it's pretty suspicious. And they're pointing to it and going, hey, look at that. <laughs> Just a, one or two things in conclusion, and first, thank you. 
I did want to add that there, you talked about Absalom Jones being one of the lesser known founding fathers. Well, he's, in some cases, he's been resurrected. In fact, the Cathedral of St. John the Divine has an annual Absalom Jones celebration uh -huh. right around his birthday. I believe he was the first African American Episcopal clergyman That's in this correct. country. And that, so yeah. they've taken note of that. And Richard Allen, I believe, in the AME Church. So. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, this will be online. There's a URL on the sheet that you can see on the way out. It'll be a few weeks yet, but, but we encourage you to log back in, make some more comments if you'd like. And um, thank you all for coming. Good job, man.